information today. They go one live, Facebook live. And here go to um, Instagram live. Yeah, man, we about to get it in. I'm gonna just go ahead and let these fees fill up. I'm gonna let these fees fill up. This is gonna be the first time I go live on all my social media sites. I'm going live on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And this is a special one right here, man. It's a special one. This is a commemoration one right here, man. Of one of the new African um, uh, rebellions that's not being talked about, but it's being commemorated on this day. And what I'm talking about is the 50th anniversary of the Glenville um, shootout in the Glenville Rebellion. Because we don't like to use the word riots because we know the words riots is a racist term uh, that was uh, put out there by the, the racist you know, power structure of the United States of America. So we don't use the word riot. We use the word rebellion because anything that we do is either a rebellion or a revolution. You see what I'm saying? I mean, some people like to use the word insurrection, man, but I use the word uh, rebellion. And this is a, a, a most recent rebellion, a 50-year rebellion. And this topic is so important, man, because I've been doing a little bit of research, man. I've just been going over the stats on the progress of our people from 1968 to 2018. And from the stats, man, it's not looking good at all for new African people, man. Like, if I'm going to read, I'm going to get to these stats in a minute. But I'm going to get into this rebellion first because this is the most important reason why I'm doing this live is to commemorate uh, the new African freedom fighter, Fred Ahmed Evans, who led a, re a, a rebellion on this day in an all-black new African neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio, on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. And um, I thought it was very important to do this because I know a lot of people don't talk about this rebellion. Most of the elders do because the elders know about this rebellion, but a lot of people from my generation and younger have never heard of this re rebellion and shootout that took place July 23rd to July 26th, 1968, Eastside, Cleveland. Um, I'm going to just get right into it then. I'm going to just go ahead and get right into it. I try to let people come into the feed, man. Um... And it's important to commemorate these things like this, man, because you got to keep these things, um, um, this information put into the community so they can see the other side of our history because we know we're taught uh, a colonized history. So it's always important to talk about these type of rebellions and these type of things that took place recently. We know about the slave history. We know about the slave rebellions. But we're going to talk about some more updated rebellions, man, because like I said, man, it goes back to even what, you know, with the crazy controversy with Kanye West, man, when he put that old reactionary bullshit out there about we ain't fighting back and we some slaves. But I'm going to just put it to you like this, man. Kanye West ain't, ain't well studied on our history, so he don't know nothing about freedom fighting. You see what I'm saying? Our people have always resisted. We have always been fighting. And we still continue to fight right now. You see what I'm saying? And let me go ahead and get this shout out real quick before I get started, man. To all the new African political prisoners and prisoners of war that's behind the wall right now. Who sacrificed, who were, who were continuing the struggle, the struggle of our freedom fighters of slavery, man. And also, let me just give praises to the father, Alba. Saladin Shakur, man. All praises due to the Abba Saladin Shakur. Always got to give praises to him first. If it wasn't for Abba Saladin Shakur, there wouldn't be no Shakurs in North America. So I always got to give a shout out to him, man. Shout out to the August 3rd Collective, New African Independence Movement, Free Matulu, Free Sayuka Shakur, man. Let me just go ahead and get right into it. I ain't going to hold this up because I don't want this to be long. It's going to be real brief. And it's also going to be summer. I'm going to summarize it up of, of how things have not progressed for our people, man. And we need to be more focused on our economic progress 
here in North America, man, because it's looking real bad, man. That's all I can say, man. It's looking real bad. It's not funny. I don't find these type of things funny because it, it makes no damn sense that we got all these millionaires in America. We even got a couple of billionaires in America, man. And our people are still living below the poverty line or just above the poverty line here in North America. It's a damn shame that you got millionaire rappers, millionaire um, entertainers, millionaire actress, all these type of people, man, got millions in their banks. They get in front of the TV, especially these rappers, man. I'm calling out all rappers, man. Especially these rappers, man. You get in front of the video, you got on all these chunky chains, you talk about how much money you got, uh, you splurging, you throwing money, you got high price cars, you got big mansions, but what the hell do your people got here in North America, man? To the point that 50 years have went by since our peoples put it down, the revolution of the 60s put it down, and our damn people all across America are still in the same position or worse than our people that came before us, our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers, our mothers. We have made no progress in North America. And then y'all got this strange ass uh, illusion being pushed out all across the world like black people, new African people in America living good when we ain't living good. You got people in Africa think we living good over here in North America when that's a goddamn lie, man. We living below... The majority of new African black people in America are living below the poverty line. Stop fronting. You know what I'm saying? You can put on your high price sneakers. You can put on your high price gear. You can put on your high price jewelry. But what the hell do your family got? What the hell do the majority of 43 million new African people in America got? Why do projects still exist? Why does the ghetto still exist? Why do you ride through every black city in North America and there's a ghetto? Why does it still exist? You see what I'm saying? If we living so damn good. You see what I'm saying? Y'all project this image to the world. We living so damn good. But we got projects, ghettos, and over 2 million black men re-enslaved in, in the prison industrial complex all across the United States of America. But we living good. But we free. We free in North America. What a damn illusion. A straight damn illusion, man. And you got all your peoples all across the world in Africa who are looking up to black people in America and they thinking black people in America living good. Every person I talk to outside the borders of this country think we living good. They want to come here. But I always got to tell them, man, our struggle ain't no different than your struggle, man. We ain't free. We still slaves here in North America, man. Still ain't got our 40 acres in the mule. Still ain't got our land back. And the majority of us still living under the poverty line or just above the poverty line. And before I get started on this, let me just say this and I'm going to get off of that black bourgeoisie tip because this ain't what the video about. Um, let me just say this for the record, man. Like, If you don't have generational wealth, you are in the struggle. Let me repeat that again. If you don't have generational wealth, and what do I mean by generational wealth? Generational wealth is basically goddamn near a billionaire. If you ain't close to being a billionaire, and I let some of these millionaires slide, you are in the struggle. You have not made it. You are not rich. And even some of these millionaires, you are not rich. Why? Why? Because if you don't have no land and if you don't have no assets to pass down to the generation, your children that's coming after you and your grandchildren that's coming after you, you have not made it. You are not rich. So stop getting on the internet, kicking all this, talking down on other new African brothers and sisters. Oh, I got more money than you, so I'm better than you. No, you're not. Because are your seeds and your grandchildren going to live off what you got today? Are they going to live off that? Do you have that to pass down? If you don't have that shit to pass down, you have not made it. Stop idolizing 
Jay-Z, a.k.a. Slave Z. Stop idolizing all these cats who don't give off. Flying F about you. You see what I'm saying? Who don't do nothing for new African people. Who don't do nothing for new African communities. I'm sick of the entertainment celebrity worship. I'm tired of it. And this is just my little rant before I get into the topic. I'm tired of black people worshiping celebrities. I'm tired of you worshiping entertainers. You do not live like those people, man. Stop trying to be like those people, man. They're doing nothing for your community. Shit, Oprah Winfrey can get us out of poverty by herself with the wealth she got. What's she doing in North America for New Africans? Nothing. At all. Nothing. Because I got the stats. I got the stats right here to prove it. I got the stats. Over 50 years, nothing has changed. As far as housing, uh, economics, ac uh, assets, and land, nothing has changed. Nothing. And we, and we tend to forget this is an overall struggle, man. This is not an a individual struggle. This is an overall struggle of 43 million black people in America, man. And half of them in the minority are millionaires. It's sad. It's sad, but I'm going to get off that. I'm going to get off of that. Let me just go ahead and get into what I what I came to talk about, man, which is the 50th anniversary of, of the Glenville uh, Rebellion. Write this name down. If you never heard of this great new African freedom fighter, his name is Fred Ahmed Evans. Let me repeat that. Fred Ahmed Evans. Evans and he had an organization that he created in Cleveland, Ohio which was called the Republic of New Libya or it was called the Black Nationalists of the Republic of New Libya and what this great freedom fighter did in Cleveland, Ohio man, this man set up his own bookstore this man set up his own um, what was was the store? His own store where he sold individual products like clothing, uh, resources for the community. Uh, he made everything black, and he set this up in a section of the Glenville neighborhood of Cleveland, Ohio. And let me remind you, when this great freedom fighter Fred or Man Evans did this, this is when this is when Cointel Pro was on their strategic warfare that they was taking out on uh, quote-unquote black nationalist movements. You see what I'm saying? But I like to say prefer preferably the war that COINTELPRO took out on the black nation, the new African nation, because it wasn't just our great leaders and freedom fighters who, who were being attacked. It was our communities that was being attacked. You see what I'm saying? So really it was the COINTELPRO war on the new African nation, the black nation, the black community, and the black nation uh, inside the United States of America. So let me just put it to you like that. Um, let me just give you um, a brief history about Fred. Fred Amant Evans was a former, and, and, this is, and this is the key, man, because a lot of our brothers that became leaders, they came from this background. Fred Amant Evans was enlisted and actually participated in the U.S. Army. Uh, I.E. reminds you of Geronimo Pratt. So when Fred Amen uh, Evans came back to America, same thing with Geronimo Pratt. He's seen no difference of our condition and our progress here in North America. So when he got back, he, he started to study Malcolm X. So when he started to follow and study Malcolm X, this is what thrusted Fred um, Amir Evans into the movement. And this is what made him want to change the conditions of his community of Glenville. You see what I'm saying? This is a great brother. You got to Google this brother. And you and just Google, period, the 50th anniversary of the Glenville uh, Rebellion. And so when he got back, and let me remind you, Glenville and Cleveland is also where the great Malcolm X gave his speech, the ballot or the bullet. If you don't know that speech, go Google that speech also. Malcolm X's ballot 
or the bullet speech. He gave this speech in Cleveland, Ohio. See, a lot of people don't know about Cleveland, Ohio's uh, uh, illustrious history of, of, of black resistance. So this is one of the main reasons why I'm making this video, because we already know about the Black Panther Party and all these other organizations also who were, you know, they was like kind of in the forefront of the black liberation struggle. So I'm, I'm trying to speak on Fred Amir Evans for the people who don't know who he is to research him and to, you know, get into his history and share some of this Midwest history because it's coming out the Midwest. So also... This is also where the great Martin Luther King also gave a speech at in the um, Cory Methodist Church. This is where Malcolm X gave his speech at also. So a lot of organizing was going around, uh, was going on within that church also. So I had to get that little church a shout out because we, you know, we got churches that, that that's, you know, they, they let the freedom fighters come in there and do their thing. Um so, yeah, let me move on. So he created his own movement, which was the Black Nationalist, a new Libya movement. And uh, let me just throw them throw them in here also because they was a part of this rebellion also along with the Cleveland, Ohio community. This is another Black Nationalist organization called the Afro-Set Black Nationalist Party for Self-Defense. Let me repeat that. The Afro-Set Black Nationalist Party for Self-Defense. And you had people like Saba uh, uh, Keeley, who was a part of this movement. So these movements were uh, kind of moving at the same time period. Um, and, and for me to springboard off of that, let me just go back to the rebellion that took place before that so I, so I can give you a great idea. There was another rebellion in Cleveland, Ohio that took place before this rebellion. Because I got to put this in here. It was called the Huff Rebellion. And the Huff is another all black new African community that was in Cleveland. Also, this took place in 1966 where four um, blacks were killed and over 30 blacks were injured. N the year after that, 1967, because I got to plug these so it can make you get up to where I'm at now. Detroit had one of their worstest rebellions called the 12th Street Rebellion that took place in 1967. Um, 43 people were killed. And over 250 uh, black people were injured in Detroit that year. Because we know Detroit got up for the get down. And they had like, they had several rebellions. So I had to plug that in there so you can get an a, a idea of the timeline. So from the, the Huff riots to the Detroit 12th Street riots, we come up to the Glenville um, Rebellion of 1968. Um, and why, did, and why was this rebellion so important? This rebellion was so important because like a lot of our movements back then, this is just showing y'all how we had control of our communities. Even if they were for a brief moment, we had community control, which we don't have today. We don't have community control of our neighborhoods. This is why you have the high rate of black-on-black -black proximity crime because I don't like to use the word black-on-black -black crime you see what I'm saying? Because that's a reverse racist term from the United States power structure. So I just like to say new African or black proximity crime. Because what is proximity crime? Proximity crime is just a uh, crime that's taking place amongst people who live close to, close to each other in a close proximity. Which the Europeans are killing themselves in the United States of America more than blacks are killing themselves due to proximity crime because everybody knows if you live close to each other those people are going to transgress on each other so white people are out here killing each other at the same rate that black people are killing each other in america also which is proximity crime so i just had to throw that in there um and the overall theme of these rebellions why do these rebellions take place they take place due to capitalism which is racism See, a lot of people get race, try to separate racism from capitalism. No, capitalism is racism. You can't get one without the other, man. So let's, let's get that overstood too because a lot of people don't understand that terminology. The problems that take place in the impoverished communities, the third world communities of the United States of America is due to capitalism. Capitalism and poverty. You see what I'm saying? Racism is nothing but capitalism and poverty. So let's just get that straight. 
poverty takes place in white communities also. You have a low impoverished communities of all ethnic groups in the United States of America. It's just our impoverishment is is the highest. You see what I'm saying? If you want to throw the Chicanos in there, you could you could throw the Chicanos in there also. But since we were bought here as slaves, I deem our poverty as being the more longer poverty. You see what I'm saying? Because of what we went through. You see what I'm saying? Dealing with our enslavement of our ancestors. So these rebellions happen due to poverty and capitalism, period. You see what I'm saying? And another thing, the reason why I'm commemorating this rebellion is the fact that you, when you, the reason why I tell you you got to study these type of things is that the same things that happened back then is still going on now. One of the main elements of why Fred Amir Evans and those um, new African um, groups rebelled that day was due to police terrorism. So I have to throw that in there. The main reason of this rebellion was due to police terrorism and COINTELPRO and their illegal tactics that they take, they take out on black communities period you see what i'm saying because once fred or Mayor evans started to organize and started to teach uh self-determination and start organizing under self-determination these pigs are, are harassed this man and his organization his stores and uh because he had a bookstore also they are they tried to get this man's store shut down four different times for some bull shit I'm going to just put it out there simple and plain like that. Just plain old terrorism. You see what I'm saying? Terrorizing um, blacks who are minding their own business amongst their own people. You see what I'm saying? And then eventually, through an FBI informant, they got this man's, show, this man's store shut down. Got his bookstore shut down and his regular store shut down. And got this man evicted out of his residence. See, these are the tactics that Cointel Pro use to shut down um, um, black nationalist organizations back in the 1960s. This is a uh, strategic warfare. You see what I'm saying? A lot of people don't think that we are at war. We are at war. We've been at war since our ancestors were brought to this continent. So anything that takes place on our community by police or, or any type of organization that comes from the United States government, uh, that is an attack on your people, your nation, and your community. Period. You see what I'm saying? A lot of y'all just don't get that. And a lot of y'all are afraid of that, which I can understand. I'm going to let that slide. So, people like Donald Freeman, Saba Akili, Fred Ahmed Evans started to be harassed and monitored by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. This was the first attack on these black nationalist organizations of Cleveland. We and we know what we know what the dirty tactics that J. Edgar Hoover did in the 1960s that so many of our people don't even take the time to read about. And also, let me throw this in here: these these FBI files are now available. You can get the Glenville Rebellion FBI files right now. Just Google it. So you can see what the FBI and COINTELPRO were doing to these great brothers and sisters of Cleveland, man, who were just organizing under self-determination to do for themselves. Every time we try to do, to do for ourselves, the government attacks us. Facts. Period. And, you know, that's why we haven't made no progress. Because every time we try to make progress, the government attacks us. And they also attacks us through our own people, Negroes. It was a black informant that that sparked this sabotage and takedown of the um, Republic of New Libya and 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 um, the other organization which was called the Afro Set Black Nationalist Party for Self Defense. I don't really think or really know if they was connected to the Black Panther Party, but you can kind of say that they took after the Black Panther Party because we know the Black Panther Party was well established by the time these groups sparked up in Cleveland. So, I just wanted to break that part down right there because I wanted to give y'all the idea of that these type of black national organizations existed in the Midwest. Because a lot of people don't talk about the Midwest uh, 
freedom fighters of that era and what happened. So this is what basically happened on July 23rd, 1968. And there's so many conflicted stories to what happened from the uh, Fred, uh, Mayor Evans side and the police side. But you know, I'm not taking the word of no pigs. So I'm just going to take the word of the community, the people, and the organizations that were attacked on that day and over the course of three days. Or, uh, yeah, three days, because it ended on July 26th or the 27th. It's one of them. So, on July 23rd, Fred uh, Man Evans and his organization were at his apartment. And this is from the word of Fred uh, Man Evans. Uh, he said he woke up out of his sleep. And when he woke up out of his sleep, he looked out the window and seen the Cleveland PD were outside his house, surveilling his house. And while he was surveilling his house, um, he noticed that it was a black man running up the street. And when the black man was running up the street, he seen the police shooting at this young black man or this black man, period. And when they shot at this black man, Fred, out the word of Fred, um, a man out of his mouth, he seen this black man gun down. Like so many of our brothers today who running off and getting shot in the back and getting gunned down. You see what I'm saying? So when they, when Fred or Mayor Evans say he's seen this young black brother getting gunned down, he woke up, the rest of the crew in the house, armed up, ran outside, and put down the engagement on the uh, Cleveland Police Department. You see what I'm saying? So they like to say that Fred or Mayor Evans and the uh, Republic of New Libya, which was 18 members at his apartment at the time, the police made it like they just ran out the house and just started shooting at police. False. Why would he do that? Why would he just run out the house and just start shooting at the police? Makes no sense whatsoever. What man in his right mind, what, what man or woman in his right mind would do something like that? Why would you just run outside and start shooting at the police? So we know that story is bullshit. Cointel Pro shit. You see what I'm saying? So we know that story, uh, the sto side of the story is not true. So I tend to believe what the community said. That, uh, and, and you notice they never talk about this. It was a brother that supposedly had got gunned down. And this came out the words of the mouth of Fred or Matt Evans. You see what I'm saying? Which we all know what Quintel Pro and the police do. They try to make it look like we liars. So... I'm not taking their word, so I'm just going to take the word of Fred or Matt Evans. So they went outside, put down the attack on the um, Cleveland Police Department. But let me rewind it a little bit. After, they, after the first engagement, the police fleed. They fleed out of the Glenville neighborhood. About, I would say like 10 minutes later, or probably like 20 minutes later, this is part of the story also. They said that a tow truck security people came into Glenville, which many people believe that these were undercover police. So when the tow truck driver came back, when they got out the truck, they had on uniforms that looked like Cleveland Police Department uniforms. So when Fred or Man Evans and his organization seen them, they engaged the tow truck drivers. And when they engaged the tow truck drivers and pushed them out to black community, Cleveland um, Police Department re-entered Glenville and started shooting at Fred or Man Evans and his organization and started attacking the other brothers and sisters of that neighborhood. This is what really happened that day. When the Cleveland Police came back to the all-black Glenville neighborhood, they opened fire on the whole community, period. And the only reason why I'm, 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 I'm really making this a point is that I'm showing you the self-determination of a few individuals who took it upon themselves to defend their community, something that we don't do today. And that's even from the stuff that we do as far as uh, our contradictions, like black proximity crime. We don't defend our communities. You got all these organizations out here claiming that they are black revolutionaries, they are black organizations, but ain't none of these organizations doing a damn thing. As far as defending their community, 
and I'm talking about from both forces, our own people and the white man. You see what I'm saying? Because that is the job of a community servant, a so-called revolutionary, a so-called black organization. It's to defend your community, clean up your community, even from your own people, transgressions. You see what I'm saying? Because we tend to let our own people off the hook with the criminality that they force upon everyday working class new African black people in the community. But we supposed to have these so-called black organizations, right? But why ain't none of them doing their job in black communities across the United States of America? Why is it still violence? Why is black women still getting raped? Why are police still coming into our community and shooting down innocent brothers, sisters every day? If these so-called black organizations exist. See, these are the contradictions. This is why the, pro the progress hasn't been made in 50 years, man. It's too many contradictions. And it's too much talking. No organizing. You see what I'm saying? We have to get back to what these brothers and sisters was doing in the 1960s. Period, man. They laid down the black print. You see what I'm saying? But we tend, it's too much ego. It's too much ego stroking. It's too much internet talk. It's too much internet armchair revolutionaries. You see what I'm saying? It's too many armchair revolutionary organizations. So-called revolutionary organizations, man. Because damn, man, we still getting murdered by the police. Your, your brother, your, your sons and your daughters Still getting shot down by the police. Your daughter still getting raped and molested in the community. Another contradiction. I mean, all these type of things, man. Not saying that they wasn't existed back then, but it was a minimum. Like, you, you really didn't hear those type of things. And when those type of things took place, these organizations took it upon themselves to take care of that. Eliminate that problem before that disease spread. I just don't get it. You see what I'm saying? You shouldn't even be calling yourself a revolutionary if you're not doing the the the, the community work, to being a servant of the community, man, which is defending your community, period. Where's the self-defense units? Where's the community patrol? These brothers and sisters wasn't afraid, man. Fred Ahmed Evans wasn't afraid, man. He took the sacrifice of being a servant of the people. He put his life on the line for his people. It's not enough of that today. Black people are not putting their, uh, you know, I hate to say it, not putting their life on the line for their community, man. Until black people start to put their, li their lives on the line for their community, nothing will change. Nothing will progress forward. It's a standstill. 50 years. 50 years, nothing has changed. So, moving along with the rebellion, after the shootout, Fred Amen Evans and his comrades were captured, took off to prison, I mean, took off to jail. This is when the community, and this is what, I'm, this is what I mean by community, the community took upon themselves to rebel because that was just the first part of the rebellion, which was the shootout. July 24th comes around. The community rise up for their black leaders. Because I'm going to call them black leaders because they were real black leaders. You see what I'm saying? The whole community of Glenville and most of the community of Cleveland rose up, flooded the streets, burned down the power structure buildings, burned down the police uh, stations. In Glenville. This was the community. The community rose to the call. You see what I'm saying? For their brothers and sisters. Who sacrificed their life. For their own community that day. Who got fed up that day. Who got tired of the police. Uh, profiling them. Criminalizing the black community. Criminalizing the black leadership. Of uh, Glenville. You see what I'm saying? Who took it upon themselves to rise up. 
and bang it out with the pigs, man. You see what I'm saying? The community rolls up. And I know people like to say, man, but what's the good in burning down your own community? You just burning down your own community. Hey, man. You ain't heard what Martin Luther King said, man? Riots are the language of the oppressed. When the oppressed is fed up and there's no other way to turn, they destroy. It might not be the correct way to destroy, but they destroy. You see what I'm saying? They have to release that frustration of being oppressed and being transgressed on by these racist police departments across the United States of America, man. And this racist power structure, period, who keeps our people oppressed. Economically. Because like I always tell you, economic oppression is the worst of oppression. Because if it wasn't for economic oppression from capitalism, it wouldn't be no riots. It wouldn't be no rebellions. It wouldn't be no insurrection. You see what I'm saying? But you got our people still in poverty. Poverty creates violence. Then that violence starts to eat its own communities, its own people. This is why black proximity crime exists. It's just a reflection of the ruling class politics because it's all politics. You got the crooked ass ruling power structure politics, which trembles down to the everyday nine to five working class politics, which in turn has an effect on your everyday lumping proletariat street politics, which is the politics of the streets. You see what I'm saying? Which is your black proximity crime, black murder. You see what I'm saying? It stages, it steps to this shit. It's hierarchy to this shit. You see what I'm saying? That you must learn and study, man. Political education. So, the Cleveland community uproar, they uprose that day. Then eventually, they shut it down. You know, it got quelled back. And um, Mayor Stokes did a strategic job that day, today, 50 years ago. He didn't send the white policemen into the Glenville neighborhood. He sent black policemen into the Glenville neighborhood to try to quell the violence down. Which they did do that. You see what I'm saying? Which was a smart strategic tactic on part of Mayor Stokes. You see what I'm saying? But I'm just using that as an example. At the end of the day, um, 15 people, seven, 7 to 10 people dead, 15 injured. Three of them was police. Which Fred Amon Evans would later be charged with uh, capital murder of uh, uh, of police, and he was sentenced to uh, capital punishment, which was death by the electric chair. He never made it to the electric chair because they overturned his sentence and gave Fred Amon Evans life in prison. You see what I'm saying? Where he later died in 1978 from cancer. So today, if you got some liquor, water, anything. Tip your cups over for Fred, Amir Evans, and all those great brothers and sisters in the new African uh, community of Glenville who stood on the principles of self-determination, self-defense, and retribution. Period. Let's give a sal salutations to these brothers and sisters on this day and to teach this rebellion to your kids, man. This is the only reason why I make these type of videos, man. So you can you can teach these type of things to your kids to let your kids know that your people were never a passive people. We always fought back, man. We always resisted. We always wanted control of our community. We never wanted the power structure to, to control our communities because we know we would never be free by the power structure controlling our communities. The only thing that comes from this racist government is death on new African black communities and incarceration and slavery and poverty, period, man. So this is why we try to get this embedded to your mind that we we might have to go to another strategy. And, and, and I'm not saying it's another strategy because this has always been our fight since our ancestors got off them boats, which is what? Independence, sovereignty, land, nationhood, period. What you think these people were fighting for, man? They was fighting for their own nation 
their own communities to be theirs and governed by their own people, man. Period. This is the true fight. Not the fight that the bourgeoisie, civil rights, neo-civil rights movement like Al Sharpton and these people keep indoctrinating your mind. The Black Lives Matter movements keep indoctrinating your mind with reform. Reform will not free black people. Reform will not stop the pigs from killing your, your children. It's never going to stop, man. The only thing stops this type of thing is separation. You don't want to hear it, but that's the facts. We did better, and I hate to say it, when we were segregated. This is where Black Wall Street and all these great thriving communities came from in the segregation periods when we weren't living amongst these people, man. You seen what happened when they, when, once we started living amongst these people? The oppression got worse. The poverty got worse. The incarceration rate got worse. Then... Before we were, uh, you know, when they released us out of segregation and Jim Crow, man. It got worse. 50 years later, look at us. Still in the same position. Still getting murdered. By every police department across the hells of North America. And yes, North America is the hell of the world. Period. Like all, you know, it's other countries across the world that's going through hell. But who are the people that facilitate this hell? The hells of North America. The hells of Europe. European capitalism. European imperialism. Is the reason why colored people all across the world are oppressed and still not free. Period, man. Let me move right along, though. Let me get right on into this. Let me get into the stats. 50 years later, okay, I told you about the rebellions. 50 years later, what's going on with our people? Let me run it down to you. From 1968 to 2018, this is from the Washington Post. You can Google this article on the Washington Post. African Americans have made no progress in 50 years. Matter of fact, I'm going to put the links in the bio when I, turn, when I get off this live. It states, in some cases, new Africans are worse today than they were before the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Let me repeat that. So all my African people who watching also across seas can understand what I be talking about when I'm telling you people that we're not living no better than y'all are. It may, our oppression just be maybe a little bit different, but it's no different. You see what I'm saying? In some cases, new Africans are are worse off today than they were before the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Period. And what do I what do I mean by this? 2017-2008, I mean 2018. 7.5% of new African black people in America in America are still unemployed. Let me re repeat that. 7 in 2018 7.5% of new African black people in America today are still unemployed. What were the numbers in 1968? 1968, 6.7% of new African black people in America were unemployed. A damn shame. The numbers have not changed. Let me repeat that. 7.5% of new Africans, black people in America are unemployed today in 2018. What was the numbers in 1968? 6.7% of new African black people back in 1968 were unemployed. What is the difference between 7.5 and 6.7? Nothing. At all. Period. Let's move on to the most important thing. Land and ownership. Here in America in 2018, 50 years hasn't changed. The rate of home ownership, one of the most important things for the working class of America, hasn't changed. Black ownership is 40% today. 
What was the percentage back in 1968? The percentage of black ownership back in 1968 was between 30 and 40 percent. What a damn shame. Let me repeat that. What is the percentage of black home ownership in 2018? 40%. That's 30 points trailing the European Americans we live amongst here in America. These people have always been 30 to 70% ahead of us in home ownership. And still is 30% to 70% ahead of new African black people in home ownership today. Right now. In 1968, same stats. 30 to 40 percent of our our mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers only own 40 percent of black ownership of housing in America. Nothing stat hasn't changed one bit. Hasn't even budged one bit. We still don't have no land, man. Still don't have no housing, no decent housing at all. But you got rich black rappers, rich black businessmen, rich black politicians, the rich black bourgeoisie, and we even got a couple of billionaires. What's wrong with that picture, man? That the totality of 43 million. Africans, new African black people in America still only own 40% housing ownership from 1968 to 2018. What's wrong with that picture? No progress whatsoever. Moving right along. New Africans are 64 times likely. And this is mass incarceration that hasn't changed since 1968. New Africans Black people in America are 64 times likely to be jailed than white people in 2018. 1968, it was 5.4 times that black people were likely to be jailed more than European Americans back in 1968. Let me repeat that stat again. New African black people are 64 times likely to be jailed more than white people in 2018. Let's rewind. 1968. 5.4% of new African black people are likely to be jailed more than white people in America in 1968. The stats has not changed. The incarceration rate has tripled between 1968 and 2016, man. What a damn shame. The wealth gap. Let me read the wealth gap to you. The wealth gap, the wealth gap has tripled between whites and blacks in 50 years, man. Tripled. Let me say it again. The wealth gap, the wealth gap between whites and blacks in the United States of America have tripled in 50 years. The typical wealth of, of new African blacks in 1968 was tripled then. The net worth, let me run down this net worth. The net worth of white families today in the United States of America averaged $171,000 a year. Let me rewind that shit. The net worth of European American white families in the United States of America today households overall average is 171,000 a year far as well. That is 10 times that of black families, man. Let me say that again. That is 10 times the wealth of black new African families here today in America. But you free. How are we free? When your people don't have no wealth to pass down to their kids or their grandkids. How are we free? That is impossible. Because if you don't have no economic wealth uh, uh, to pass down to your 
future generations, that means your families are coming into poverty. They're being born into poverty. Your kids are being born into poverty. This is why the numbers don't change at all. Because your kids are being born into poverty, man. We don't, so we don't have nothing to pass down. We don't have no land. We don't have no black businesses like that. And don't get me wrong, I see the black businesses trying to thrive, but it's not enough. It has to be, it has to be more. More has to be done. You see what I'm saying? These people have a triple deficit ahead of our families, man. And they always had a ahead advancement of us since slavery. You see what I'm saying? Always had an advance edge and start over our people, man. And you trying to tell me in 2018 from 1968 that wealth gap has not closed. Period. This is why rebellions take place. To go back to why I'm, why I'm making this video, the 50-year commemoration of the Glenville Rebellion. This is why rebellions take place. People get fed up of being in poverty. And I, and I hate to say this, but another one is coming soon. It's coming. Another rebellion is coming. Trust me, it's coming. Because black people are not getting out of poverty here in the United States of America. We're not getting no house, no decent housing. We don't have no decent food because we don't have no land. We can't grow no food because we have no land. Period. You have to depend on somebody else to grow your food. That is slavery. Period. That is poverty. Period. Because you can't grow your own food because you have no land. Period. No land, no resources. No resources, no food. No food, no freedom. Period. I mean, that's just the simple, simple mathematics of this whole struggle, man. To get free, man. Here in America. It's for land. The struggle is for land. Like we always say in the New African Independence Movement. The struggle is for land. But I just want y'all to see the reality. Tamir Rice's are still getting gunned down. Emmett Till's are still getting murdered by these racist pigs. Eric Gardner's are still getting choked to death by these pigs. The same thing, the reason this Glenville Rebellion sparked in the first place was due to police terrorism. So that's why all I'm trying to say is nothing has changed in 50 years. Trayvon Martins are still getting murdered by this racist establishment and their police departments, their watchdogs, their lackeys who are only here to serve and protect the property, the land, the buildings of their employers and their slave masters. You see what I'm saying? It's going to continue. One of your children is next. And I'm not trying to wish this on nobody. Because we got to do better, man. One of our kids are next. If we don't do nothing about this shit. And do something about our whole economic plight here in America, man. This is why we must struggle and strive for self-determination. Ujama is what, you, is what we call it during Kwanzaa. We must struggle for Ujamaa, man. Black corporate economics, cooperative economics, period. That's what we got to struggle for. You know what I'm saying? Because another rebellion is coming, man. Because we're not getting out of poverty. We're not getting out of oppression. And I just wanted to make that clear because I know my, my viewing is, 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 is international. And I just want my brothers and sisters in Africa to know that we're not living good here, man. A few of us are, you know what I'm saying? A few of us are, but not not the majority. Not the majority of 43 million new Africans. You know what I'm saying? And, and I'm going to just close off with these quotes before I shut this lie down, man. 
The great Malcolm X said this, man. He said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, that's not progress. Feel me? Let me repeat that. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull that knife out six inches and try to say that we have made progress, that's a damn lie. Because the knife's still in my back. The oppression's still in my back. The slavery's still in my back. The murder's still in my back. The unemployment's still on my back. No housing is still on my back. No land is still on my back. Incarceration is still on my back. You dig? It's still on your back. The knife's still in there, man. Because we ain't pulling it out. We got to pull it out ourselves, man, and defend ourselves at all costs. Defend your kids. Defend your community. You see what I'm saying? Because the knife is still in our back 50 years later. Still in there. Malcolm X is gone, man. Fred Amir Evans is gone, man. Our ancestors, our elders are transitioning. Our, our elders are transitioning to the ancestral realm. Meaning, they are dying. Our elders are dying. So it's our time. Our time is coming. We must, do, our time is now. If you're my age, it's now. And younger. What are we going to leave for the younger generation? What are we going to leave for the younger New Africans, man? Time is now. You see what I'm saying? Our elders dying, man. They transitioning. Our political prisoners are dying behind the wall. What are we going to do? Our kids are being birthed into poverty. What are we going to do? See what I'm saying? What are we going to do? And we must over, we must recognize and overstand and start teaching our babies that our freedom fighters are not terrorists. They're not terrorists. How is fighting for equality, human rights, uh, fighting to get out of poverty, how is that a terrorist? And another quote that I'm going to quote from the great Che Guevara. This man says, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Let me, re let, me, let me say that again. One person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. The great Che Guevara. So stop letting this establishment label your freedom fighters as terrorists. You see what I'm saying? Because fighting for freedom is not terrorism, man. What them police is doing to your kids and what this crooked establishment is doing to new African communities... That's terrorism. You see what I'm saying? When our mo the majority of our people are living just above the poverty line or below the poverty line, that's terrorism. That's economic terrorism. Period. You see what I'm saying? That's pure terrorism. And we know why ghettos exist. You see what I'm saying? Where did they come from? They came from the racist institutions. And the racist establishment. You see what I'm saying? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm fitting to sign off on that note. You know what I'm saying? What are we going to do 50 years later? Glenville Rebellion, man. Go research that. The Glenville Rebellion shootout of 1968. Download that. Study that. Pass that on to the next African, man, or the next new African, or your descendants, your kids. We're, we are resistance people, man. We're going to get free. We're going to get it together, man. So, on that note, I'm going to sign off, man. Hockey Quiddy Shakura, man. Free the land.